our first presenter is, uh, I should just say, you know, we're doing this rather casually, but we have, we're really lucky today. We have two really phenomenal people in this field who've been, you know, really are, it's not, uh, you know, fake news to say these people are, you know, ab absolutely at the, uh, in the vanguard of work in this uh, area of political economy and, and um, about particularly the political economy indeed of the period uh, of the early 21st century, the period that has, you know, uh, been characterized since 2008, crisis and uh, uh, economic difficulty. They're both in the forefront working on that. Mark is uh, Eastman Professor of Political Economy at uh, Brown, and he's a member of the editorial board of the Review of International Political Economy. Uh, he's the author of Great Transformations, Economic Ideas, and Institutional Change in the 20th Century, um, which is a comparative analysis of ideas in the crisis of the 30s and the 70s. Um, in 2013, he published Austerity, The History of a Dangerous Idea, and that book immediately um, became a focus of scholars' attention uh, because of how clear and sharply it argues its case and the way in which it traced the development or evolution of this notion of austerity over a long period of time. Uh, the fact that it came out in 2013 was, of course, uh, didn't hurt sales. Didn't hurt sales. Uh, and, uh, I, but I think uh, beyond that, uh, many of us who, you know, read the book when it first came out uh, were ex very much uh, benefited by it and stimulated by it and wanted to debate it. Uh, so we're very happy to have Mark here. I just say, if his talk today, there are a couple papers that are available um, that, um, from you know that kind of provide some sort of background on on this work. One is uh, called Global Trumpism: Why Trump's Victory Was Thirty Years in the Making and Why It Won't Stop Here. It's a very admirably brief and exceedingly concise uh, presentation of Marx's framework and the basic uh, historical and theoretical elements that constitute it. A, a longer version uh, that lays it out um, with a lot more historical uh, detail and so forth. It's called Black Swans, Lame Ducks, and the Mystery of IPE's Missing Macroeconomy. So without uh, further ado, thank you very much for coming, Mark. And thank we're you. much looking forward to your talk. So we'll begin. So some comments on this. The idea is 10 years on from the crash. So first, let's begin with the disappointment. This is a left-leaning crowd. You should be used to disappointment. That's basically what we <laughs> specialize in. Here's what I will do. I'm going to talk about what actually happened in 2008 to 2010 in the United States. Because if you're going to do 10 years on from the crash, it's easy to forget what happened. And so much of it is so important to where we are now. Uh, I'm going to talk about how that became such a problem for Europe, because if you remember when the crisis started, Pierre Steinbrück, who was the social democratic finance minister, said, this is a crisis of Anglo-Saxon capitalism. Nothing to do with us. Eleven months later, you had a problem. So what happened? I want to then talk about where all this came from. That's the line from the global Trumpism piece in terms of this has been 30 years in the making and it's not going away anywhere soon. And then finally, I want to talk about not just what that means in terms of the populist reaction, but what this means for our understanding of party politics. Because I think this has also been utterly transformative of the way that we think about politics as construed through political parties as we generally understand them. Uh, and then the last line is, and why we will survive all of this despite generic leftist pessimism. I've got to the point now when I switch on The Guardian in the morning, I just want to shoot myself. <laughs> I mean, did anybody read George Monbrot's column this morning? I mean, really, why get out of bed? I mean, seriously, just, just shoot yourself. It's that bad. I'm, I'm fed up of this uber pessimism. I can't do it anymore. So, in the words of David Byrne, how did we get here? So, 
there's some uh, bubbles. Now, remember a thing about, there is a thing called the real economy, there's a thing called the financial economy, and essentially financial instruments are meant to be replicants of the real economy, no matter how complex these things are. So if your real economy is chugging along at 2%, your financial sector is meant to grow at 2%. So if you have a look at this chart, what you'll find is the DJIA, which is the Dow Jones, the FTSE and the Nikkei. And particularly for the Anglosphere, you've got 6% a year compounded growth going into the crisis in equities on an underlying economy of 2%. That's a bubble. By definition, that's a bubble. Next one, uh, housing bubbles. Well, you know that shed that you bought in the back of Dublin Airport? went up by 130% for no apparent reason over a 10-year period. And that went almost everywhere except Hong Kong, who were still recovering from their own housing collapse 15 years later. So you have these two giant asset classes of equities and real estate, both on a massive tear for, in one case, 20 years, and in another case, 10 years, before it all goes wrong. So why was it so difficult to see those bubbles? Why was it so difficult to see it coming? Anybody know who this is? David Vinear, CFO of Goldman Sachs at the time of the crisis. The line is, we are seeing things that are 25 standard deviation moves several days in a row. Well, when you consider that 25 standard deviations is three times, no, 10 standard deviations is three times in the life of the universe, 25 standard deviations is pretty much out there. Now, why would somebody who's obviously very smart, after all, he makes tons of money at Goldman and they can rip your grandmother's face off and make her feel good about it, why is it that he's saying such obviously silly things as regarding statistics? And the answer is this. The way that we think about risk or thought about risk in the banking system was wrong, fundamentally wrong. There was an idea that if you made each of the component parts safe, the system was safe, that it was scalable, that it was additive, and that basically risk was normally distributed. So there's a technology called value at risk, which allowed you to basically estimate what, how much you had out in terms of risk assets at any particular point, summing that up to one nice number. Now, the problem with this is very simple. There's loads of hidden correlation in the banking sector. And it was built through mortgages, but it could have been through any other asset class. And essentially what you end up with is too much leverage in the system all at once. Everything is connected to everything else. My hedge is your hedge. There's no differentiation. My risk asset is the same risk asset you're in. We're all pulling in the same direction. So you build an incredibly tightly entrained, very, very tightly wound system with a huge amount of leverage. If you start to estimate the probabilities of things going wrong, they're wrong, i.e. you don't take account of tail risk, it's going to go crashing down amongst your ears. So first one. So what does that mean? It means if you think about a world in terms of modeling risk or uncertainty, we actually live in a world basically between quadrants two and three. So if you think about complex payoffs, a world of convexities, all the way up, all the way down, and then you think about the tails on the distribution, not normal, they're actually out there and quite far, then where do you live? In our world, you don't run into 11 foot tall people. But banking crisis is the 11, is it walking into an 11 foot tall person. And we do it way more than 25 times or three times or zero times in the life of the universe. We do this all the time. Banking crisis frequencies have been going up since the end of the Bretton Woods era, both in their severity and their magnitude right across the world. So again, why didn't we see this? And it's again partly because we just don't have the optics for doing it, because it's not just a question of data, it's the fundamental way that we understand risk versus uncertainty in the way that we play with assets. So that was one weakness that was in there. That hasn't been remedied. We still do exactly the same thing now. That's why I'm mentioning this. Some other large problems. If you go back to the 1970s, which we will shortly, the 1970s was a period that was very weird for many reasons, but for one of them it was because you had historically very low real interest rates because of the effect of inflation. And what that meant was when you released finance from its post needle box in an environment of high but very rapidly declining inflation, interest rates fall, lower, fall less than inflation rates once they're under attack after the Volcker shock. So you end up with, in the 1980s, very high real interest rates, which is why you have the Wall Street moment. It's impossible not to make money when you're getting 9% real for showing up at Citibank in 1983. So when you've got that, you have an environment in which you've got your credit starved, huge demand for pent-up credit, very high real interest rates. How do you make money when everybody's piling in to make that money? How do you make money on a declining spread? The only way you can do is to play the game by volume, so the up the leverage. So the hidden, the hidden fracture, if you will, in the financialized system is that to continue to make money, you have to pile on leverage more and more and more. So that what this chart shows you is just before 2008, what was happening in the banking systems of the world? And the most famous one, of course, is up there with Iceland, 
where you've got a thousand percent of GDP in bank assets in basically a rock in the middle of the ocean that doesn't produce anything. Now, how do you get to that position? You get to that position because people forget something or in fact they've never been told it. What banks called assets are actually liabilities. So I have the example I usually give is I have a condo in Boston. That's an asset. Not to a bank it's not, it's a liability because they don't want to manage real estate. They're interested in the mortgage attached to the property, which to them is an asset, but to me is a liability. Assets and liabilities sum to zero, hence why in most economics prior to the crisis, nobody worried about either distribution or finance. One person's income is another person's debt, etc., etc. But when you've got all that built in terms of leverage, that is to say your operating capital is 2% and your daily operating leverage is 60 to 1, Bundes, uh, for example, um, what do you call them? Deutsche Bank, right? Then you are just an accident waiting to happen. And this wasn't not unique to Iceland. As you can see from those figures, this went right through the system. So you have a micro level weakness in that you can't understand the risks you're running, but you think that you do. And you have a macro level weakness in the fact that the whole system is interconnected and levered up to an extent you can't possibly imagine. Then we decide to really turbocharge this by having a really screwed up way of borrowing money. So rather than relying on depositors, we'll by and large the banking systems gave up on depositors and went straight to repo wholesale markets. So take the example of Apple. It sits on a giant cash pile. What does it do with it? It lends out a bit of its cash pile overnight, and then it takes in exchange for that some kind of collateral so that if you don't pay back the loan, they've at least got the collateral. We were running out of AAA collateral, which was T-bills, in part because loads of them were being hoarded in Asia as an after effect of the great financial crisis of 1997. So what did we substitute them for? Sovereign debt. That was the European story, in part because the European Commission in 2001, in an attempt to build European repo markets, put a directive out that said all European sovereign debt issued in euros will be treated the same in repo transactions regardless of the country of origin. You just made Germany into Greece by fiat and vice versa. In the American side, we went for AAA mortgages because after all, hey, they were AAA. That means that they're as good as a T-bill. So you can do huge amounts of borrowing overnight and lending 30 years on the assumption that liquidity is perfect and markets are perfect. That's another accident waiting to happen because you get collateral calls and the whole thing falls apart. Similarly, the whole notion of securitization spreading risk around proved to be a bit of a canard. There was the whole issue of CDS and basically building insurance policies onto bonds and then when you run out of bonds using the income streams from the insurance policies to create new synthetic bonds so you had an infinite number of mortgage replicants. This was incredibly dangerous, unbacked financial speculation. In a model in which you don't know the risks you're running, you can't calculate the leverage, and you don't know the hidden interdependencies in the system. You get where I'm going with this. And then on top of that, we have a whole bunch of economic ideas we believe for the past 30 years that turn out to be total crap. That markets are efficient, that banks have skin in the game. No, they don't. They have everyone else's skin in the game. That people have rational expectations, that investors basically value risk, that systemic risk is the same as individual risk, and that too, bi too, too big to fail is not a problem because we're managing risks well. And the take home, of course, was the whole was different from the sum of the parts, and we only knew that in that moment of crisis when it all went wrong. So what's the take home on the first part of coming back 10 years after the GFC in the United States? The cost of this for the United States was 13 to 15 trillion in lost output, bank recapitalization, and everything else. At a time in which we have no money for schools, no money for infrastructure, we can always find a trillion and a half to give people who already have everything even more money, but it's amazing how much money we can just magic out of nowhere to save the assets to the banking system when we have to. This, of course, is paid for by sticking private debt on the public balance sheet, which is why you have a jump in public debt to 40%. And then the purpose of the book on austerity was to point out how that was the greatest bait and switch in human history. Because by basically bailing out the banking assets of the top 20 percent of the population and then putting that on the public balance sheet in the form of public debt, then tightening the belt to cut spending. You're effectively taking the costs of that insurance and dumping it on the one part of the population that can least afford to pay it. Wages have been where they were since 2008. Nothing has changed for the bottom 60 percent and they've been stagnant for a generation. And I won't read it out because I'm sure you've read it already, but basically there's the best statistic I can find. In 2015, bonuses on Wall Street after the bailout were twice as much as everybody's minimum wages for the same year. So what's the euro story? If you think that's fun, wait till you see this one. 
<clears throat> this is interest rate convergence in euro uh, bonds over a 30 year period. It's also the greatest moral hazard trade in human history. So here's how this works. If you look at the red line at the top, that's Greek debt before there's ever a euro. Why is it so expensive? Well, because it's Greece. Their tax collection's bullshit. They lie about their accounts. They don't make anything. Uh, guess what? You're going to pay 25% to hold the debt. That's a one in four implied probability of default. That's a market price and shit correctly. That's how this works, right? Interestingly, though, even if you go around here, what have you got? Italy, you got, you know, Greece, things like that, Spain, the Netherlands. They're all tracking between 15 and 10%. Now, why is this? Well, because if you're a bond investor, you care about two things, exchange rate risk and inflation risk. And there was this magical new thing called the euro that was going to come in, and we announced it in advance. And what it meant was nobody would have a currency anymore. And that meant that there's no inflation risk and there's no exchange rate risk. Now, if that's the case, I know what's going to happen is that the yields on those bonds are going to go down and the prices are going to go up. I want to be in at the start. I want to buy as many of those bonds as possible because they're going to become more expensive over time as the yield goes down. I can add that to my capital base and lever up my financial institution. I can become too big to fail as a business model. And that takes us back to that slide where three French banks have 233% of GDP, two German banks have 160% of German GDP, four Icelandic banks have 1,000% of GDP. It's all built into this script. Now, here's the deal. I've got national regulators. I'm a French bank. Let's say I'm Credit Agricole. I used to be a farmer's bank. I then become one of the largest unbacked derivatives traders in the world in short order. And I start to buy as much sovereign crap as I possibly can because I'm chasing that spread down. And I'm making money on a decline in spread. So I'm buying more of the stuff and more of the stuff. And eventually I become huge. I'm 100% of French GDP in my assets that could become liabilities. And I go to the regulator and say, you've got a problem. I'm playing a moral hazard trade against you. I've become too big to fail. I can take excessive risk because you'll bail me out. And the French regulator said, no, because we don't have a printing press anymore, asshole. So what this means is you're going to have to go to the ECB, and that's run by the Germans. So good luck with that one. <laughs> but they called their bluff, and they kept doing it. So what you saw is this interest rate convergence going into the period of the euro, and the minute there's a shock to the system, boom, it turns out Greece is still Greece. It turns out that all that risk that was in there was completely suppressed and was not true. Now, the way this is usually told, the official version, is very convincing, but it's fundamentally wrong. So the official story is that all of this interest rate convergence leads to a huge amount of bond buying, which gives tons of money to periphery sovereigns. This enables them to have very lax public finances. So, see, Ireland spends a lot of money. Space. It's like Greece, Portugal, Spain, right? It's the pigs, right? So they've got very lax public finances. In other words, they're spending money through the government because they think it's a good idea. That's called lax public finances, right? This, in turn, erodes wage competitiveness. So relative to Germany, your unit labor costs go up, you become less competitive. Would be important if you were a net exporter, but a lot of these countries aren't, but put that to one side. Uh, this shows up in current account imbalances. Basically, everybody ends up running a, a deficit against the Germans because they're super competitive and everyone else's wages are too expensive. <laughs> and all of that is financed, <clears throat> as I said, by external debt increases, borrowing from core banks who are buying periphery assets, which are then becoming cash that you're using to buy BMWs. That's basically the story. Now, as a result of this, you get the pigs. Concerns about long-term sovereignty of Europe's periphery leads to a collapse in confidence and a capital flight to safety, that being buy boons, dump these assets. Bond traders sell the risky Mediterranean sovereign debt in the greatest moral hazard trade in human history and perceived risk-free assets such as British gilts, German boons, US treasuries become the thing. That's when the spreads go up. That's the yield for Italy going to 7%. That's the sovereign debt crisis. Sounds convincing, totally wrong. That's not actually what happened. And that's my new word, washed. That should be what happened, but never mind. 